So very good afternoon to all present. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the concluding session of the sixth EU India Energy Regulatory Workshop series being organized under the EU CACP by FSR Global. And uh, the topic of today's discussion is offshore wind energy. And I'm Parul Bakshi, a research fellow at FSR Global. I'll be your moderator for this session. Um, without further ado, I welcome uh, Shweta Ravi Kumar, Executive Director at to please give her welcome address. Over to you, Shweta. Thanks, Parul. A uh, very good afternoon and good morning to uh, our friends and colleagues from Europe. Uh, it's it's really a pleasure for us to have uh, this particular episode because it's uh, a completion of six cycles of the EU India regulatory workshop series where we have had the chance to go into certain topics uh, deeper and deeper over the years. And I think it's a very unique series because uh, we we just didn't take a topic one off and uh, try to discuss it and forget about it. But rather, as a community, we have been discussing and trying to see how we can connect the dots between the different uh, topics. And some of the engagements have also uh, resulted in us having a, a research report that came out. And, um, and some of the discussions have led to other bigger initiatives, uh, such as the Smart Grid Observatory. So... Today, it, it, today is the last of the six-part series uh, within the sixth cycle. Uh, too many sixes, but uh, just bear with me. And uh, we're very happy to bring you a, a slightly unique topic uh, for the, the last session, which is on offshore wind, a topic that's uh, uh, discussed extensively in, in the European uh, uh, energy corridors. But India is also gearing up to investigate and roll out uh, uh, this as another uh, alternative um, clean energy uh, 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 energy production into the energy mix for India and is looking to explore how we can uh, tap into the potential that India has. And not just that, a lot of other uh, neighboring countries with coastlines are also interested in, in trying to understand how offshore wind can work in this side of the world. So uh, we're happy to bring to you this topic today. And we have a, a stellar set of uh, speakers here. Parul will quickly introduce you to each of them. Uh, I will invite all of the discussants and all of the participants to uh, to make sure that you drop your questions in the uh, chat box. And we'll pick it up towards the end of the session, uh, where the speakers will also be available to answer some of them. So uh, this is definitely not the last uh, of the different series that we'll have with the EU delegation to India. We'll continue this. Uh, but up until uh, the next time, this is the last in this cycle. Uh, but off with that, uh, I'll give the floor to Johanna, who is uh, our counterpart uh, from, from the European side, who would like to also say a few words. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first of all, a big thanks to the Florence School of Regulation for organizing this sixth edition of the EU India Regulatory Workshop series, as you just uh, mentioned, Sveta. Uh, which has become a strong symbol of cooperation between India and the EU in the past years. So it is a great pleasure for me to take part in the workshop on offshore wind today, as we are actually at a very interesting moment in our EU-India cooperation, because uh, we are currently drafting the EU-India Strategic Roadmap 2030, which will lay the ground for our strategic cooperation in the five coming years. So the EU has been a leader uh, in offshore, uh, offshore wind energy with significant investments and technological advancement in the sector. So countries like Germany and Denmark, for example, have established themselves as pioneers in offshore wind energy with large scale projects contributing significantly to their renewable energy portfolios. The EU has set uh, ambitious targets to increase its offshore wind capacity aiming to reach uh, 300 gigawatt by 2050. The deployment of offshore wind energy is therefore at the core of delivering uh, the European Green Deal, which is our main uh, strategy. And a lot of initiatives have been introduced in the past couple of years, like for example, the European Wind Power Action Plan. So what's, what is interesting is that uh, we can already witness that the expansion of wind energy and the wind industry across the EU has created quality jobs and enhanced our energy security. In EU and India, India's commitment uh, to clean energy transition is becoming more and more tangible, as you know. So India has, uh, of course, also set very ambitious targets for renewable energy generation capacity. 
and has implemented new markets design regulations and network planning strategies, both domestically and also internationally. This makes India's strategy one of the world's largest energy transition programs. And the most prominent example is India's national offshore wind energy policy, as you are all aware of, I guess, which constitutes the first major step taken to harness this potential. It has recently identified several offshore wind sites along the coastlines of Gujarat and Tamil Nadu and is working towards developing offshore wind projects to meet its renewable energy targets in collaboration with its Center of Excellency on Offshore Wind, supported by Denmark. But I guess we will hear more about that later on. And uh, by partnering with the EU on offshore wind projects, India aims to tap into its vast coastline and abundant wind resources to diversify its energy mix and reduce its carbon footprint. So this collaboration is uh, very important to us and it's a win-win proposition offering both economic and environmental benefits for both regions. The EU Trade and Technology Council that was uh, recently established takes stock of the existing cooperation in this sector with a view to prepare a dialogue on resilience of supply chains, for example. And the working group three of this uh, Trade and Technology Council uh, will explore synergies uh, of EU and Indian supply chains for offshore wind in particular. So the EU-India Clean Energy and Climate Partnership uh, that was agreed by our European and Indian leaders at the 2016 summit promotes policy and regulatory approaches, uh, business solutions and cooperation, as well as research and uh, green te technology in order to enable both in India and in the EU the required energy transition. And the third phase of this program will start in March next year and will essentially focus on offshore wind, but also green hydrogen. Uh, and it is this partnership that has been conducting the EU-India regulatory workshop series, uh, including the one today, in collaboration with FSR for the past six years. This ongoing series of events aims to facilitate discussions on various topics related to clean energy transition, and I hope that today we will be able to identify more, even more synergies to work together on offshore wind. So together, the EU and India are embarking on ambitious offshore wind initiatives, ranging from research and development to capacity building and project implementation. By leveraging each other's strength and expertise, we are not only driving down the costs of offshore wind, but also unlocking new opportunities for sustainable development and green growth. So thank you once again to FSR for organizing this important workshop. And I am very much looking forward to hearing the speaker's insights, but also, of course, the audience's uh, reactions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanna. I think uh, you've perfectly summarized and set the stage for the rationale behind not only the series, but the topic of the day. So you've made my life very easy. So thank you so much. And um, as uh, Johanna mentioned, we look forward not just to the engagement from the speakers, uh, to all the participants. Thank you for joining us. And please feel free to put in your questions in the chat box during the session or also we have a specific uh, segment where we will be taking up question and answers so uh, you can actively participate uh, during that time as well. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we're very fortunate to have representation from MNRE itself today and I invite our first speaker for the day, Mr. Lalit Bora, who's Joint Secretary, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, Government of India. So over to you, sir. Uh. Thank you, thank you, uh, Parul and uh, Sweta, for sending the invitation. And uh, uh, thank you, FSR Global, for organizing this event uh, in association with the uh, India EU Strategic Cooperation. Uh, I I think am I audible? Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. So uh, India has been. Uh, started uh, its a wind energy journey in the somewhere around 1990 however the actual pace of re development in india started from the year 2014 and since that we have seen that uh, 
uh, we just got our uh, last year's uh, wind installation figure and uh, in the last financial year we could do the 3253 megawatt of wind installations in india and uh, solar installation was somewhere around 15000 plus so overall the re addition in country during the financial year uh, 23 24 was more more than 18000 megawatt however as we all know that uh, the honorable uh, prime minister of india has set a target of 500 gigawatt of renewable energy by 2030 and looking at that huge target the uh, out of this 500 the wind has to be about 100 gigawatt we already have a, a total installed capacity of somewhere near 46,000 megawatt. And uh, the project uh, of about 15,000 megawatt are in the pipeline. And uh, this year, we have already bidded more than 10,000 megawatt of the projects. So those projects will come in next uh, two to three years. And the, we have we have set a trajectory where we will be uh, doing minimum uh, 10 gigawatt of wind, which may be either in the form of the hybrid project or the uh, RTC project, or we have come out with the load following uh, RE, pro, RE bits also. So all these combined together, our aim is that that we have to this year uh, in the year 24 25 we have to go beyond 5.5 to 6 gigawatt installations and then uh, overcome the threshold of installing the 10 gigawatt every year so that at the end of 2030 uh, we could reach the target of 100 gigawatt now in this the Offshore wind uh, has a very important role because with more and more RE coming up and the variabilities which are associated with the wind and solar, it becomes very essential that uh, we go for the offshore wind where the variab variability factor reduces to the large extent. And to work on that, the uh, 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 India has got the uh, first bid issued. So as we know, you can see from the uh, slide which I have shown, we have a huge coastline. So in, in a way, India is blessed to have the high uh, insulations for the solar installations. At the same time, we have a coastline which is of more than 7,600 kilometer. Uh, and uh, we will be, uh, the uh, initial study says that the CUF on these sector will be more than 50%. So that will in turn reduce the LCOE. And uh, owing to the consistency of the absorbent, we are sure that we will be able to have a capacity of about 423 gigawatt from the various sources. Next, please. So, like we all know what are the advantages of the offshore wind. It has a high adequacy and the reliability, lower storage requirement, lower generation reserves, a lower balancing reserves, reduce power from the exchange and the high employment potential compared to any other RE sources. So, this becomes essential because uh, you see the, uh, the grid managers are always uh, averse to more and more RE entering into the Great. And therefore, they when, when we discuss with them with the advantage of the offshore wind, then they seem to be quite positive and interested in having more of the offshore wind into the system. Next, please. And uh, the scale of offshore wind is very high uh, because the one gigawatt will require about 250 to 400 square kilometer. The hub height has to be 150 plus. Then the 
weight of nacelles and this thing will vary from 400 to 750 ton. Then distance from offshore wind, it can go up to 165 kilometer. However, for the initial projects which we are going to get commissioned in India, we are not moving further off because to ensure that the cost does not escalate and the confidence of the developers come to the system. It has a huge rotor diameter. The weight of offshore assembly is uh, very high. Depth is about 57 meter and other factor. Next, please. However, the most interesting part is that, that the global trend of the LCOE is showing a downward trend. And uh, India is one place where we have one of the lowest per capita consumption of the electricity. And in order to complete our SDG 7 goal, we have to ensure that the electricity is available to each and everyone. And for that matters, it becomes very essential that we get electricity and we get electricity as a, at a lower price. So the reducing trend of the LCOE is a welcome sign. And therefore, uh, in last few years, we have started speeding up our process for starting the first offshore project in India. Next, please. If you look at the uh, various activities done, we started with the offshore wind energy policy in 2015. Then we did the LiDAR equipment for the wind resource assessment. Uh, we got the two-year reports in 2019, 2022, we came with the strategy paper. And in the strategy paper was again revised in the uh, 2023. But after that, now we have come out with the offshore wind lease rules, which has been notified by the Ministry of External Affairs. And in the month of February, we came out with the first bid for leasing of the offshore wind site for 4,000 megawatt. And uh, the Honorable Finance Minister has already announced in her budget speech that uh, the VGF for the initial offshore wind project will be provided. And we are quite optimistic that uh, by the month of September, we should be in a position to uh, bid out the 500 megawatt of offshore wind projects with VGF, uh, that is viability gap funding from government for the state of Gujarat. And the study for the data collection for the state of uh, Tamil Nadu is going on. And we expect that by next year end or in the start of in the April 2025, we should be able to release the bid for uh, Tamil Nadu VGF as well. Next, please. So if we look at the policy, the policy has been made to uh, serve the industry and reduce their burden. So the uh, it, it specifies that the entire uh, EZ, that is exclusive economic zone of India, uh, from the coast will be available for the offshore wind development. The MNRE will be the nodal ministry and the NIVE, which is the National Institute of Wind Energy, will act as a nodal agency as well as the single window clearance for obtaining the clearances from the various ministries and uh, identify all the essential elements that need to be considered for the development of the offshore wind projects. Next, please. Uh, if I, if I come to the strategy paper, the strategy paper has clearly spelled out the three models. The model A is where I have said that uh, the initial data and survey will be done by the NIVE, which is a technical institute for the wind energy in India. And those data will be shared with the prospective developer. And uh, the, here the government will assure the offtake and we will provide the viability gap funding so that the prices matches with the prices of the uh, DISCOMs. Uh, in this model, we plan to have about 500 megawatt of the coast of Gujarat and 500 of the coast of Tamil Nadu. In model B, for which the bid has already been out, uh, the developer will have the exclusive access to the seabed block to carry out their studies 
and then later on they can develop their plant there and project under this model will be allowed to sell power through the open ac access route. Let me be clear here that the Indian market is growing at the rate of 8 to 10% 10, 10 electricity market and the demand in the uh, exchange is very high and every summer and winter we are touching the higher peak. So the demand of electricity is increasing and therefore we perceive that the uh, market will be giving the higher returns. When it comes to the Model C, Model C will be where the developer can come on its own. He can choose the seabed. He can do the study and later on it will be bidded and the developer who has done the study will have the first light of refusals. Next please. Uh, at the same time, the grid connectivity part also, a lot of progress has been done. The initial grid for the 5 gigawatts in Gujarat and 5 gigawatts in the Tamil Nadu till the offshore pooling station will be provided by the government and the developer will have to just uh, get the things connected at the offshore uh, substation. From offshore substation to the onshore pooling station and subsequent integration into the national grid will be done by the uh, Ministry of Power, uh, that will be the PGCIL and the CTUs. Next, please. We have come out with the trajectory as well, and uh, based on this trajectory, we have already issued the bid for uh, uh, under the auction capacity under model V for, for 4 gigawatt. Uh, as you all know, that we are going through the election process in India. And during that time, the code of conduct and other things just uh, kick in. Therefore, this uh, capacity of 0.5 gigawatt, which was to be done in the Model A, will be done post-election. And same will be the case for the next year as well, that we have set the trajectory and we'll keep on doing bidding for these models based on the learning which we get from the initial uh, bid and the response of the industry. However, we have made that it will be a total 37 gigawatt will be bidded by the year 2930. Next, please. Uh, uh, as you can see that uh, we have demarcated the five zones in the Gujarat, that is zone A, B, C, D and E. And in all probability, uh, there is a blue mark within the zone B uh, that will also be available to us once it gets it's being given to for some other purpose once that is clear then that can be given to us so this is the zone which we have de demarcated for the offshore wind developer development in the uh, gujarat state next please and out of these zones one zone has been taken off which will be auctioned which will be auctioned through the vgf support and the project side which we are envisaging is 500 megawatt plus at this place. The NIVE has done all the study that include the geophysical, geotechnical study. All those data will be shared with the developer so that he can save time and the uh, resources to get these things done. Next, please. So these are the activities which NIVE has already done. I have already told that they have done the geophysical, geotechnical, the environmental impact studies, the stage one clearances, all those things have already been done. Next, please. Uh, when it comes to the coast of Gujarat, uh, Tamil Nadu, in Tamil Nadu, the potential is much higher. And here we have demarcated the eight zones in the Gulf of Mannar of the uh, coast of Tamil Nadu. So this is the place where we will be having the most of the offshore wind development. Next, please. And 14 side of the coast of Tamil Nadu, uh, they will be developed across the various zones. And uh, the site 7 under Model A, hai, that we are keeping it for the VGF support, 500 megawatt, which we are expecting that by end of 20, uh, 425 or the start of the 25, we will auction it. Once the all study is being completed, the study has already been awarded by the NIVE to the concern agencies. Next, please. 
uh, apart from that we do understand that uh, all these projects will need a uh, development of the port and therefore we have identified uh, two port however these two ports are tentative ports once the project developed and the response comes then uh, most probably either Tutikorin and Kandla the, both the port will be developed and they will be developed with the support from the government so that the cost of these does not pass on to the developer. But we are looking for the, the development of these ports, not only for the installations of offshore wind in India, but we are looking it as a place where the uh, export to various offshore wind sites in world and especially in the nearby area where uh, like even our neighbor Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, they have announced that they will be entering into the offshore wind area. So we can export to those areas as well. Next, please. This is some tentative calculations which we have done. And uh, this has been done, most of this research has been done with the support from the uh, BA Denmark. And we are really thankful to them that uh, the center of excellence is being run here in the ministry with their uh, support. Uh, so uh, if we look at the resource assessment activities, so when it comes to the uh, uh, model A, these activities will be done by the NIVE. Then there is a cost of wind turbine, which we are expecting that once the market develops in India and the uh, production starts in India, then these prices will further go down. Then the transmission infrastructure, this infrastructure, part of that is now being done by the PGCIL. So this cost will also go down. Then the installation commissioning cast and the total capex. So we are expecting that with these things, the capex cost will go down to about 16 crore or so when it comes to the installations of the projects where the transmission is being provided and the study is being done by the NIBE. Next, please. Yeah, so that's all from my side. And uh, it is really uh, good. And I look forward to listening from the other speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gora. I think uh, you raised some very important points, not just on the importance of uh, the uh, you know offshore wind and the potential that India has, but uh, a specific point that you raised on you know the potential that is there for the region to kind of come together. We already discussed CBET. Uh, so, you know, kind of bringing in wind, offshore wind into that uh, would be an interesting point, which I hope we can take up during the Q&A as well. Uh, without further ado, I think Mr. Gora also spoke about uh, the Gujarat, the state of Gujarat and the potential and the demarcated zones. And our next speaker, uh, you know, has experience of working in the state and uh, maybe uh, uh, Mr. Rajendra Kharul, who is the managing partner and CEO of Climate Hub India. I invite you, sir, and I hope you would also shed some light on your experience um, in the state. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Varun. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah, can I share my screen? Please do, yes. Is that visible? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thanks, Parun. Thanks, uh, Shweta, for uh, this opportunity and uh, organizing this workshop, basically, uh, which is a kind of a very burning topic at present, uh, both in Indian context as well as in the global uh, uh, sphere. Also, a lot of discussions about offshore wind energies are happening. And the targets, as everybody knows, probably getting scaled up to uh, 5x, 10x kind of thing from today till 2030. Uh, so another six to seven years time frame, the world is expecting probably to add something like 50 gigawatt uh, uh, on an average. Yeah, so uh, I'll be very brief basically on uh, uh, presentation part, but would like to interact more with the audience and uh, the colleagues uh, participating here. Uh, 
this is the brief of what exactly is happening uh, on the offshore wind energy in India. Uh, over the last decade, the offshore wind development has been there, uh, some progress, uh, some studies, some uh, policies are coming out uh, uh, from time to time. And the government has been very keen and consistently driving this initiative in the Indian context. Uh, if you can see uh, on the top, the MNRE has already come out and uh, JSR has already mentioned about the various initiatives from the, the, the MNRE side. Uh, the policy came in 2015, then the, the drop bid for 4 gigawatt came in 2022. Then we had a see uh, these rules published in 20, uh, uh, 23 December and then the VGF and the, the final tender. On the, the left side, if you see, there are various technical uh, assistance program uh, supported by either EU or Danish uh, organization or UK's uh, FCDO. Uh, so there has been a consistent effort on doing some R&D work and studies, which will support the, the Indian uh, uh, stakeholders and the decision making in the Indian context. Nive has been also involved actively doing some field work on coming out with guidelines for studies and measurements and have carried out the measurements, of course, in Gujarat as well as in Tamil Nadu also. And as Jason mentioned, they are taking up further steps for some more the sites to be uh, have the wind resource measured in, in the Tamil Nadu area. Uh, beside that, there has been some plans from CTU or C uh, CEA for evacuating almost a 10 gigawatt uh, equivalent of offshore wind from both the region, the Tamil Nadu as well as uh, Gujarat. So CEA and CTU is preparing almost 5 gigawatt evacuation plan. Uh, there has been the inclusion of offshore wind carbon trading under the Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement, which has been announced by the government of India. And Ministry of Shipping has announced some shipbuilding assistance, uh, wherein the 20% capital subsidy is available for uh, the specialized vehicle, which are used for the offshore wind, uh, basically in the Indian context. So some framework or some policy and uh, uh, regulatory framework is evolving. Some studies are happening. Uh, 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 around uh, this whole, whole concept. However, the key challenges uh, in the Indian context uh, had been, there has been a discussion all the time that the cost is high. JSR has shown the, the cost of per megawatt cost is about 21 plus crore and plus additional cost may be there. So but the cost in the Indian context, which are estimated by various support programs are in the range of 21 22 crores kind of per megawatt. We don't have any proven experience as of now in the Indian context in terms of what exactly going to be the cost, delivered cost uh, per se. So naturally the tariffs are going to be much higher than the expected one. And some of the studies which are done earlier, uh, either the COVID studies or uh, some other studies. I have been part of the permit study, which was which has identified these uh, zones basically, and the program was supported by European Union. Uh, recently, uh, last two years, the UK government is also supporting the Aspire program, and uh, I am fortunate, fortunate again to be part of the Aspire uh, delivery uh, program also, and I was leading this offshore wind thing for the the Aspire team. So basically. The constraints which are coming out in the Indian context are need to be seen addressed uh, uh, on a uh, early basis so that the bottlenecks which are being experienced or being talked about by the stakeholders, those can be addressed and the, the project development can happen on a early basis. The infrastructure uh, and the supply chain establishment will, will take quite a considerable time. and. Uh, we need to allow that time and then expect the project to come over the period. The grid connection and the integration, uh, I think we are doing remarkably good and the CEA and CTU has already made up their mind and the actual ground level plans are being put in place for the 10 gigawatt uh, 
capacity of evacuation from the offshore space. Policy regulatory is a, is a evolving uh, framework as and when we are moving ahead, the, the need based uh, support is of course there from the MNRD and we would be looking at some more uh, policy support or some more regulatory uh, clarification probably from, from the MNRD on the various issues. On the technology adoption, adaptation side, basically uh, the scale of the wind turbine is totally different than the onshore. Many people uh, consider onshore and offshore is probably the, the same industry, but unfortunately it's not because onshore we are looking at 3 megawatt, 4 megawatt, 5 megawatt kind of a turbine. Here, uh, the scale has totally gone in a, in a uh, skyrocketing uh, way and people have started talking about 12 megawatt, 15 megawatt, probably 20 megawatt turbines are being looked at for the uh, 2030 or beyond uh, the installation for that timeline. So, which turbine would be exactly coming to India and uh, specifically suiting the Gujarat market or the Tamil Nadu market because both the, uh, the wind regimes are different, the wind power densities are different, uh, the gust factors are different. So uh, the customization of turbine would be essential uh, for the Indian uh, market as such. So we need to basically look at how it is going to evolve and how the OEMs basically respond to this whole uh, uh, developments which are happening in the, in the Indian region. The site assessment and data availability is the most crucial part to kick off the Indian industry. As of now, very limited uh, studies in the ground level studies, I can say, are uh, happened. Only the measurements, as uh, Joint Secretary Sir has said, uh, has happened only in the particular subzone of B3 in Gujarat, where uh, uh, the wind resource measurement, the geotechnical, geophysical, uh, and the EIA has been carried out by an NIWE and similar studies are initiated in Tamil Nadu now and the reports or the data would be available in a, a couple of years from now. So basically investing in site assessment and collecting the data uh, on ground data is going to be the crucial point if we are really keen going ahead with the option trajectory which has been set forth. So irrespective of uh, what I can say, uh, the model, whether it's model A, B, C, if we can have a mechanism where uh, the resource assessment or some other studies are carried out through a, a common mechanism and that data could be made available to the potential developer uh, irrespective of which model they are developing and there could be a cost recovery mechanism also if it's so required. So uh, we pursue probably the site assessment and uh, the surveys and studies could be a, uh, a major bottleneck uh, which will be a time consuming in, in terms of uh, the implementation timeline which we are looking at and uh, we need to address a, a few issues around that. Skill manpower or uh, development of skills is going to be the key challenge. This being a new technology, basically we need to learn a lot of things in terms of manufacturing, in terms of establishing supply chain, in terms of the project implementation, even in terms of the guidelines for the projects. Basically so many things need to be done on, on, on the, uh, the project front. And uh, the whole stakeholders, both from the, the government side as well as from the industry side, we need, uh, uh, I can say the initiatives which will be supporting the skill development specifically for the offshore related uh, component. EIA or the social impact assessment studies would certainly help and probably that should be the part of the studies which one can expect uh, to, to be carried out before the bidding. Uh, if we are doing doing that in a uh, common mode. We have been involved in uh, the state discussion for some time and we are implementing some of the projects with the uh, uh, knowledge partnership from the Shakti Sustainable Found, uh, Foundation and uh, specifically working with Gujarat and the similar project is there happening in, in uh, Tamil Nadu also. 
and there are some uh, basically uh, interesting things emerging from the state discussions and uh, states are very keen to look at this uh, new development and uh, willing to play a, a kind of a proactive role in this uh, uh, new ventures but uh, since there is a bit of one uh, uh, what i can say uh, cl clarity is not there the guidance probably need to be further uh, provided to the state what exactly they can do what they cannot do so those kind of discussion need to be facilitated typically so that uh, the states can resume their role uh, as early as possible and gear up for this uh, whole, whole development these are the some of the insights which we have gathered from the state uh, discussions so just for uh, everybody's understanding and uh, probably we can discuss those further as i said the initial surveys and studies will make a uh, lot of difference in terms of uh, curtailing the timeline for the project development and uh, we should find out more avenues how uh, these studies and surveys can be carried out of course ministry and neva is doing their bit on uh, their part but can there be further additional mechanisms where uh, surveys and studies can be taken up either by the state or by the st other stakeholders and that data can be utilized uh, by the potential uh, bidders or the period uh, either uh, model a b c wherever the bids are happening uh, the second part is the infrastructure development can there be a role for the states to play even uh, uh, right from the port infrastructure development okay right now we are looking at one port or maybe another port in, in tamil nadu but as we move on probably uh, the capacity which we are looking at 4 gigawatt 5 gigawatt uh, uh, annual auction so that would require more number of uh, ports to be developed so we should have some kind of a uh, strategic plan around that and uh, how the state can participate it where the avenues could be there for state participation in this infrastructure development that need to be identified of course the capacity building at the state level is also essential and the uh, skilling and reskilling of uh, labor or the, the overall machinery is uh, is a immediate requirement and some initiatives probably would be most welcome step in, in that direction. Uh, the direct benefits, uh, like uh, Jaisar was mentioning right now, there is a, a 500 megawatt project announced for the Gujarat, which will be supported by the center for uh, under the VJF mechanism. Uh, when we spoke to the industry stakeholder, probably the size of the project typically for the Gujarat market is seen as, as one of the constraint part because one need to customize the turbine, one need to customize the other ecosystem uh, which is there and the scale probably is not the appropriate scale. So we need to look at uh, the additional uh, uh, avenues where uh, probably uh, some more project, at least one 500 or 1000 megawatt project uh, can be supported either through state or some other funding mechanisms uh, beyond whatever the government has already committed. So if those happens in parallel, probably uh, the ecosystem development will be uh, more feasible and more lucrative in, in, in that terms. And the last point which I would like to make here is uh, basically on the approval parts and the central approval process is fairly clear. I mean, MNRE as Nive has uh, jotted down how many ministries and Nive would be a central uh, contact point or the facilitation center for them. Uh, but at the state level, uh, as of now, there is not much clarity how those the projects would be handled. And uh, of course, in Gujarat, they have already identified the agency. The Gujarat uh, Power Corporation Limited GPCR would be the uh, the nodal agency for handling offshore projects. But the similar mechanism need to be there in, in probably in, in Tamil Nadu also. So the state approval mechanism and uh, synchronization with the Nive's approval process that uh, need need a better uh, coordination and the uh, clarity on on those aspects uh, so these are some of the the insights which are coming out which i just wanted to share uh, with everyone and hope it would be useful for, for the further discussion thanks thanks for this opportunity and look forward to 
the interactions with the, the colleagues and the, the participants only. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Karul. Uh, I think your specifically the recommendations on state support have been very insightful uh, alongside, of course, the cost aspect, which has been a pressing issue when it comes to offshore wind energy in India. And I hope that we again are able to elaborate a bit more on that during the Q&A, as I can already see some participant uh, questions there. Uh, but I think having gained some Indian perspective uh, today in the uh, discussion, I now move towards uh, EU and the European expertise and experience when it comes to offshore wind. Uh, I think one EU member state which has already been mentioned by both our speakers so far is Denmark. So uh, it's my pleasure to invite our third speaker uh, for this discussion, Mr. Alp Gunsever, who is the head of Secretariat Center of Excellence for Offshore Wind and Renewable Energy. Um, over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this event. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I think uh, Mr. Bora and Mr. Karul has, uh, have covered uh, most of the developments in India. Uh, I would like to, uh, of course, we have been working together uh, uh, with the uh, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy and uh, other agencies um, uh, for a while now. and. Uh, um, and we have been trying to uh, work together on uh, the lessons from Denmark and uh, uh, how uh, we have developed uh, offshore wind in Denmark. So there are, uh, of course, uh, uh, similarities uh, and some applications that we have uh, tried to um, implement. Uh, but I also want to uh, make uh, a little bit of reference back to Denmark, uh, as you mentioned, uh, to be able to, yeah, um, um, yeah, to be able to uh, reflect uh, on the recent updates uh, from Denmark. But um, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Can you make it presentation mode, sir? Just a second. Uh, this is a PDF. Maybe I should. Yeah, I think full screen mode. Just a second. I will stop sharing first and I will share the PPT instead. Sorry for the delay. No problem. Okay. Now And yeah, perfect. Please go ahead. Oh. Yeah, I hope you can see my screen okay. now. Um, um, Center of Excellence is uh, right now. I'm uh, uh, working as the head of secretary at the Center of Excellence for Offshore Wind and Renewable Energy uh, in the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy in uh, uh, building in, uh, in Delhi. Uh, this is a joint initiative between the Danish Energy Agency uh, and the uh, uh, Indian Ministry. So that's why um, I am kind of um, representing both uh, in the middle. And I would like to start uh, with a little bit of uh, Danish case uh, for the renewable status. Of course, uh, uh, Denmark, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the demand uh, in Denmark is uh, much lower. Uh, the maximum demand in Denmark is much lower than India and the peak uh, capacity is much lower than India. But actually um, in Denmark, uh, we can say it's a, it's, a, it's a good case. Denmark is a good case for renewables. Uh, there's a, a, around 2.5 gigawatt, so 2.5 gigawatt of offshore wind and 5 gigawatt onshore wind, the solar 3.5 gigawatt. And um, uh, it has been uh, a lot of uh, renewable integration into the system with wind and solar. You can see in the graph the, uh, the January, uh, which is actually around 68% uh, of the demand uh, covered by uh, the renewables. And um, it has been uh, only 64 seconds uh, through the whole year where the demand is not covered uh, uh, by any renewable energy. Uh, and if you look at the 
historical uh, Danish tenders. Of course, there has been lessons learned uh, from Denmark as well since 1990, from the first of Schulwind. The tenders have been um, uh, developed over time, and there has been, of course, uh, from Danish side also um, uh, some drawbacks, especially uh, during the uh, expensive unhold project. But there has been a lot of lessons learned, so the uh, the market has developed uh, until 2021 uh, in a way uh, where um, in the tour tenders uh, there was that all the bits received. Uh, there were six bits. All of them were. Uh, Zero bits, uh, and actually, uh, we can call it a negative bit because the Danish government also uh, had the opportunity <clears throat> uh, to earn money uh, through the offshore wind bits. And uh, how has this happened? Of course, uh, historically, Denmark has focused more on the on the market. Um, there has been a political level commitment, a long term vision. As on the in the uh, regulatory level, uh, there has been uh, some uh, certainty provided to developers. There has also been a lot of transparency, a lot of uh, <clears throat> market dialogue, uh, keeping close uh, dialogue with the developers. And there has been a lot of uh, free market and competition uh, induced into the into the uh, into the competition uh, into the market. So uh, what we can say is, on top of that, there has been, of course. Uh, de-risking uh, and economic incentives and finance uh, and financing um, <clears throat> that will that will uh, support the development in Denmark. Um, there has been a focus, as I mentioned, mostly on the market. So there hasn't been specific uh, uh, emphasis on the industry. Uh, the industry uh, has evolved uh, like side to side with the market regulations. Um, and one of the backbones of this development is, of course, the maritime special planning. We also uh, have worked with uh, our uh, Indian partners, um, uh, both NIVE and Ministry of Mineral Energy, on uh, coming up with the uh, marine special plan for India, which you can see on the upper right hand. And on the on the uh, lower right side, you can see the Danish uh, marine special planning. Um, so uh, it is basically, we have uh, applied the same kind of uh, methodology, having a rough screening uh, on the on the technical part and the fine screening on more of the of the effects on the social and the environmental part. And then uh, uh, on top of all the layers, applying the <clears throat> uh, specific site-specific uh, effects uh, in the area. Uh, so the aim is to come up with the best possible and the most uh, uh, available uh, area uh, for offshore wind development. Um, on top of that, of course, uh, strategic environment assessment, which we call C, and the uh, uh, environmental impact assessment, which we call EYA, um, has also been implemented uh, mm -hmm. to identify the uh, nearby effects in the area. Uh, and actually, it's also uh, part of uh, the risking. Uh, uh, process. Uh, we are aiming at identifying the risks uh, in the project specific side and also on the whole coastline uh, to uh, avoid any kind of uh, uh, yeah showstoppers uh, close to the uh, tender deadline. So this is also and uh, to avoid any effects on the environment, negative effects on the environment. So this is also uh, a very important part of the de-risking process. Uh, for offshore wind development in Denmark, um, uh, for the uh, for the permitting side, the Danish Energy Agency is uh, acting as the one-stop shop. So uh, it's an administrative procedure where all the other uh, government agencies uh, from different ministries uh, are being uh, contacted through the Danish Energy Agency. This gives uh, the potential developers um, more clarity uh, in the process. Uh, and also reducing the risk of um, uh, being have to deal with different public authorities. Uh, so they only uh, they only have a single uh, window, which is the Danish Energy Agency that keeps the contact with the other um, agencies, uh, which uh, in India, uh, Nive uh, is the is planned to be the uh, single window clearance agency. 
and of course, on top of all the um, uh, yeah, uh, de-risking uh, processes, one important part is of course the offtake risk, and that is <clears throat> uh, handled by uh, like in most of the uh, European uh, markets uh, by a CFD. Uh, there has been a, again lessons learned the process in Denmark. Uh, um, mm -hmm. But uh, the latest tenders, especially the the Tor tender that had zero bits, uses a two sided uh, contract for difference. Of course, um, it's not a, a, a very conventional one, so there is of course some design uh, differences uh, in the Danish one, uh, especially with the calculation of the reference price. Uh, but all in all, this is uh, uh, also a, a big part of the risking process in Denmark while developing offshore wind projects. Um, if, we, if you would like to uh, a little bit uh, uh, deep dive into, uh, sorry, uh, into the latest tender in Denmark, first of all, uh, it's, it's uh, the tall tender. The area has been identified offshore substation export cable, uh, initial substation to be built uh, by the developer. And, um, uh, the uh, yeah, the whole investment uh, and the market dialogues have been carried out with potential developers. So when the tender starts, uh, actually the developers have a very, very clear view of how the tender is going to be. Um, the wind speeds are uh, going to be uh, measured uh, by Danish Energy Agency, um, the geotechnical, uh, geophysical site investigations, uh, environmental site, uh, environmental impact assessments, all of them. Uh, are cleared out. Uh, the responsibilities are, um, yeah, divided between um, uh, the developer um, and Danish Energy Agency. So in a way, um, um, when the tender uh, has been has been floated, uh, the the developer is <clears throat> has a very clear picture of uh, what kind of risk they carry and what kind of risk is carried by the by the government side. Um, this is uh, just to illustrate the, uh, the timeline uh, in Denmark uh, from the decision, uh, from the political decision uh, to the uh, full production. Um, even uh, in a mature market, it takes around uh, uh, eight to nine years. Um, so um, we, we, of course, the, the idea is to, to show the timelines to improve the uh, permitting processes. Uh, but uh, even even in a mature market, uh, from the decision making time to the uh, execution uh, or commissioning time, we should expect something uh, similar to say eight years. Um, in 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 Tor, um, uh, the key features of the design was uh, to focus on cost effectiveness. So price was uh, one of the main uh, <clears throat> uh, points. Uh, uh, and uh, to reduce the risk and build on time. Uh, of course, uh, international competition is key, so there's no local requirements. The idea is to the best uh, developers in the world um, and uh, to use all the tools I explained previously, the risking tools, um, uh, to reduce the cost uh, of offshore wind of the, of the project specifically. Um, after the TOR project, of course, uh, there are some uh, <clears throat> future plans, uh, um, and these are also very new. And uh, um, for example, <clears throat> a nine gigawatt of development is planned, is planned uh, for the new tender. Uh, it's called the Hesselhor tender, and um, uh, in this in this tender, uh, a new feature of the tender is that the state will require twenty percent ownership of each project. And there will be no subsidies uh, and minimum requirements on environmental impacts uh, assessments are going to be in, uh, introduced. So, um, yeah, after a, <clears throat> uh, reaching to a level uh, of a almost risk-free uh, uh, market, uh, the Danish government is also uh, uh, concentrating on other aspects that will... Uh, uh, um, that will have more uh, public involvement uh, in the in the offshore wind projects. And uh, to be uh, in order to uh, summarize these points, 
uh, we we uh, we can say that now uh, there is not a pre-qualification requirements, but there's a minimum requirement. There are minimum requirements uh, that are um, uh, introduced in the standard, such as the uh, uh, verified environment product declarations of main components, uh, verified life cycle analysis of process con uh, construction, recyclable plates, um, and environmental data collection and social responsibility. Those are the main uh, concentrated, uh, those are the new introduced uh, parts of the standard. And of course, uh, an important part of this is the old planting. Uh, and here, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it is uh, very much related to the uh, uh, hydrogen production. Um, so um, actually, uh, there is uh, there are some capacities allocated for uh, offshore wind production in the new sites, but uh, there is not uh, a minimum uh, capacity so the developer can actually uh, decide to use the whole capacity for hydrogen production. Um, so, uh, and the upper limit is uh, uh, also uh, not specified. Um, so, this means uh, the developer uh, can build part of the site uh, for electricity production and part of the site for hydrogen production. So, once part of the uh, production can be fed into the grid and part of the production can be used as for hydrogen production. Um, and uh, of course, uh, in the new upcoming projects, um, uh, there are new, uh, like the price criteria is, uh, like same in the tour, uh, is going to be the main point. Uh, there are new uh, <clears throat> uh, penalties and guarantees, of course, uh, uh, taken from tour, but uh, also, <clears throat> The, there are new uh, penalty like rules introduced into this standard, uh, but all in all, uh, there will be uh, no direct support uh, coming for this uh, project. But uh, again, <clears throat> in the in the initial discussions, uh, the CFD uh, is still uh, considered. Um, this is again uh, a little bit more detailed uh, numbers. Uh, or details of, of what the minimum requirements uh, will be, for example, for the technical uh, requirements, uh, some experience on uh, offshore energy projects, both oil and gas and offshore wind will be considered. Uh, some uh, key uh, experience uh, areas are identified and three of these uh, six key areas, uh, experience in three of, the, of these areas are expected from the developer. And, and 10 years of uh, experience should be proved uh, in these areas. Of course, there are um, financial requirements as well, uh, uh, but also, as I mentioned, <clears throat> there are some differences in the penalties for delays or, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in the deficit performance by the developer. And <clears throat> the Inch Energy Agency will be again the go the government agency uh, that will be responsible uh, for the for the uh, running of these tenders. Um, and uh, I'm it's again a, a big team, a big organization, uh, and a very complex organization. Actually, I'm part of the global cooperation uh, in this in this organization, um, and just wanted to give an example uh, of the tender team. Uh, there are analysis teams uh, for uh, basically uh, working on the economics of the, of the projects. There is the environmental team uh, working around 10 people for this uh, strategic environmental uh, assessment and around, again, seven people for environmental impact assessment of a specific project. There is the permitting team, uh, another uh, tender team uh, and legal team are also uh, supporting the offshore wind uh, project from the DNH Energy Agency side. So in total, we can talk about 60 people uh, just uh, for deployment of offshore wind in Denmark for uh, single projects. And this is, uh, again, the DNH Energy Agency is part of a big, uh, big uh, yeah, uh, committee, steering committee of ministries. So uh, it's the executive agency, but uh, again, as a one-stop shop. It's the agency that is covering most of the communication with the rest of the uh, steering committee. Um, I will stop here, and I would like to thank you for listening. Of course, I will be happy to answer any questions if something is
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gunsaiver. Um, I think some very informative points on the Danish uh, project tendering uh, conditions. And I hope that uh, during Q&A, our speakers as well as Indian participants would like to react to some of the information that you've shared with us. Uh, however, as of now, without further ado, I invite our last speaker for this session. Uh, we have with us Mr. Thor Peterson, who's the Vice President for Windpower at Niras. Um, over to you, Mr. Peterson. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you uh, to FSR for inviting me to, to speak here at this uh, interesting forum. I'm uh, happy to be here both uh, personally, but of course also on behalf of NIAS now realizing that the, let's say, green energy transition uh, focusing on offshore wind is also coming to, to India. So uh, the, you can say many things, good things have already been mentioned here by my, <laughs> what is it called, presenters before me, so I'll... Uh, try not to resonate too much, but I, all of the things I brought have already been mentioned. Anyhow, I have 15 years in offshore wind uh, and have been part of uh, 50 offshore wind farm projects all over the world, uh, not in India yet, but hopefully to come. Nias is working with some of the large Indian EPCI contractors uh, in other parts of the world for offshore wind. So I'll just um, share my screen. And then I will continue in one second. And hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes. So uh, thank you also to Johanna for uh, making the uh, presentation and introduction to the ambitious goals for offshore wind in, in Europe, 300 gigawatt by 20. Uh, 50 uh, is not unrealizable, but it's definitely a, a target that requires a lot of uh, focus for, for all the countries that have relevant sites for, for offshore wind. Elb already mentioned also the ambitions here in, in Denmark, uh, where we have installed 2.7 gigawatt and uh, 1 gigawatt with Tor offshore wind farm uh, being developed at the moment. You can say that um, the situation showed by Elb also indicates that in Denmark, as a mature market, uh, both for renewables and offshore wind, we have the entirety of our power production covered by renewables on a good day with a, with a lot of wind. That means, of course, uh, forwardly, uh, it's a different business case uh, or the incentive to install offshore wind in Denmark. So the up to nine gigawatt to be tendered here in 2024 in, in, in Denmark uh, will have to be, let's say, used for other things than uh, directly uh, as supplied to the private consumers. And that could be, of course, hydrogen. It's just highlighting that a challenge in a mature market like ours is that the business case have many more steps uh, to uh, mature and progress downstream uh, for the offshore wind to be, uh, what's it called, an attractive business. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, I'm not being negative here. I think it's very interesting for what uh, lead the Danish uh, market as well. It just could uh, mean some smaller obstacles on the way. Um, just a short uh, thing about NIAS. NIAS is a multidisciplinary consultancy company. We work, uh, I mean, internationally uh, all over the world. We have offices in uh, in 34 countries, as you can see here by the map, not in India, as already mentioned, but we are doing uh, projects in India and, and have also been involved in Sri Lanka for offshore wind. After we crossed into the new year here in 2024, we uh, surpassed uh, 3,000 staff. Of course, they are not all working in, in, in offshore wind, which I will come back to in a minute. Uh, NIAS works across a number uh, of, of markets, as you can see here, uh, bigger parts is on international consulting, uh, process industry, water and utilities, and also in building. Uh, if we jump to the far right, you can see the, the depiction here or the schematic depiction of offshore wind as part of energy and infrastructure. So on a daily basis, I sit as part of the, let's say the infrastructure vertical in, in NIAS and uh, let's say the, the services and the staff and the competences we provide comes from energy or uh, environment and planning. Uh, up here, you can see we are 130 uh, staff. Uh, so if you take sort of a glimpse uh, through our, what's it called, daily life, we would have about 130 people working uh, with offshore wind. So that's quite considerable. 
Um, in total, uh, we have been part of not re the realization of 50 gigawatt because I believe the total capacity installed nowadays is around 45, maybe a little bit more. But uh, we have provided our input to around 50 gigawatt. And that spans back to 1991, the very first offshore wind farm here in Denmark called Winneby, uh, where we did the detailed design. So in, in fact, we have 35 years um, experience in offshore wind. Offshore wind itself have, as you can calculate, 33 years uh, anniversary this year. NIAS provides a uh, one-stop, what's it called, uh, service offering, uh, environmental permitting and, and consent. Uh, I do understand that that relies, of course, to the markets where we have local presence. It, it requires local presence to make an effective implementation uh, and development of offshore wind when it comes to EIA permitting and consent. And in the case we move into a emerging market, we often team up with uh, local consultants to uh, what's it called benchmark the local uh, procedure up against the international procedure also to make sure that the projects are bankable. Um, the other arm of our uh, activities in offshore wind are engineering consultancy, which comes from very early stage with feasibility, levelized cost of energy, site selection, site layout. Uh, site conditions, and it goes all the way to the final investment decision, which also includes the detailed design. And typically, we let the project go there. But if the client wants, we we also uh, take part in in the later stages for installation, O and M, and have also done for decommissioning projects uh, in Europe, and actually did the decommissioning of Winneby. We helped design. So um, last year, we delivered 140 man years of work into. Uh, realizing this green energy transition in offshore wind, and hopefully that could also be expanded to India. Enough about NIAS, uh, and I'll keep it short, also in due respect of, of time here. So actually, I'll just keep this slide here, and I'll save the rest. So from a consultant's point of view, I've listed, I mean, I could possibly list 20, 30 challenges and opportunities that would be interesting to discuss, but I chose uh, seven to bring here, which I... Uh, as part of a consultancy for offshore mint, almost meet on a daily basis. And uh, as you can see here, some of them have already been mentioned before. Ports uh, is always uh, an issue. Uh, and in the development phase, which uh, mentioned by Alp uh, in Denmark, it's between seven and 10 years, depending on the project and delays. Typically, you would need to realize uh, port developments uh, two years into, into that phase. So already, let's say in the very early stages, it is a challenge to uh, assess the available ports because uh, in India and also in Denmark, we have a number of ports which, in, which could be um, what is called relevant for ports, uh, for offshore wind, sorry. But when it comes to assessing them, and in reality, it will only be very few of the ports which would be develop and relevant uh, for offshore wind. So that needs to be early on decided also so that the state support, uh, as mentioned here in the presentations, can focus on uh, on financing and assisting the port authorities in making the right development steps in that, such that the, the infrastructure being developed are relevant both for installation, service, uh, and base ports. Um, the next one I have here is, is supply chain, and that's not just an emerging market at the moment, that's also in mature. The vessels uh, and supply chain are, are heavily pressed. Uh, if I take a, an example on the, the vessels at the moment, most of the contractors working in offshore wind have a backlog, uh, which uh, are contracted five years ahead now. And that obviously entails a challenge uh, when you are standing in a project of what could it be in India, five to 10 years to develop offshore wind? You, you already need to make the contracts uh, halfway through the development uh, process. Um, further to that, if I take a jump here, you can say while India is a very interesting and ambitious market, of course, there are also other markets around the world which are moving very fast ahead. And they're also mature markets, you can say, where the financials and the business case and all that has been, has been set up before. And developers and also the supply chain and the vessels may uh, be attracted to stay in this market or may not. That needs to be uh, carefully considered such that the relevant installation uh, service and O&M uh, vessels are available uh, to the Indian market. One choice could, of course, be to develop uh, new 
uh, vessels to uh, uh, or local vessels in India. Also mentioned previously, grit um, is usually uh, quite a what's it called quite a big area to focus on in the early stages. The unclear grid connection uh, and the infrastructure needed to develop it uh, needs to be considered early on. Typically, that's done through a, a grid assessment, which we also do uh, all over the world. That would include uh, what's it called onshore connection points, uh, talks with the transmission system operator and also the distribution system operator. Other aspects uh, challenging is, of course, balancing the grid and achieving some kind of sector coupling. Offshore wind is not a continuous and constant uh, delivery of power. Everyone knows that uh, it delivers power when the wind is blowing. So the balancing of the grid needs to be considered such that the, at least the, the average or the lowest um, supply uh, can be as, as high as possible for the financial setup of the offshore wind. I've written here also financing across territories and, and, and borders. Um, it sounds very abrupt. It's not. It's more to say that in, in many countries, it needs to be approved from, from government or authorities that foreign investment can come in and take part in the offshore wind. And when a typical setup between an international developer and a local developer to uh, to develop an offshore wind farm, that needs to be in place, of course, for the for the for the financial backing to uh, to come into play. Um, I can also say here that the last two, three years in, in offshore wind, if you take it on a global perspective, have really shown the industry that um, the increasing costs uh, together with inflation has put a high pressure on offshore wind. Um, the big Danish developers have withdrawn with themselves from projects in, in US. We've seen projects in, in UK the, last year uh, that didn't have any tenders when the tender was open due to the, the pressed uh, financial setup. And that's what you call cost, among other things, uh, changes in the cost from the approval uh, until you can say the, the, the development um, uh, finalizing the development, which couldn't be what you call accommodated in the in the financial setup. Other markets, uh, competition and focus, I think we just touched upon it. Uh, but of course, as Johanna said, 300 gigawatt ambition in Europe means, of course, it's a growing industry. There's a lot of players, but there's also really not enough resources and competences to realize this. So uh, we need to be better at sharing uh, the knowledge and also sharing the, you can say, the will to, uh, to come and, and, and assist and, and, and develop in, in emerging markets. And the will is there, don't worry. We would be happy to come to India and work. Uh, permit consent, the EIA, I think Alp already mentioned a lot of that. Uh, of course, there is a, I mean, a high need to, uh, to do risk management for all of the, the, the showstoppers in the permitting and consent phase. I don't think I will go into that. That has already been mentioned. And the last thing I have here is um, is the political ambitions. Governments have a certain period to may implement their politics and regulations. And offshore wind, of course, takes seven to 10 years from, from decision to power production. So uh, typically, you could see some delays with change of governments and politics and this. But of course, the overall motivation for green energy transition will be there for all of us. So I will think I'll keep it effective. And uh, I'll, I'll stop here and hand uh, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Peterson. Uh, very interesting points. And uh, due to paucity of time, I'm going to dive directly into the questions that have been posed by some of the participants. And I think one question actually relates to uh, uh, what um, uh, Mr. Peterson was just presenting on the challenges that emerge. And uh, uh, we have a question which asks to kind of throw some light on the or, or the experience uh, of EU when it comes to transmission grid planning on offshore uh, power system. So um, maybe um, uh, Mr. Albunsaiver or Peterson, would you like to share any of that uh, experience on the grid planning impact? Well, I would like to hand this over to Alp, if uh, possible, as the representative for the Danish Energy Agency. Sure. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, I can try to explain it from uh, yeah, uh, like 
uh, from the public side how it is done. Uh, so there has all, all and there has been also some developments through the through the offshore wind project, uh, like historical development of offshore wind projects in Denmark. So previously, um, um, uh, the offshore wind developers were responsible <clears throat> uh, for the, the turbines and the array cables uh, up to the offshore substation, uh, and uh, Danish Energy Agency uh, was responsible uh, for. Uh, delegating uh, this uh, grid planning or the power evacuation planning uh, to Energinet. So it is the uh, Danish TSO. So uh, Danish TSO, Energinet, uh, was responsible for planning uh, and building, uh, not themselves, maybe to a third party, uh, of the offshore substation, uh, the export cable, uh, onshore substation and the onshore grid. Um, uh, of course, this cost uh, uh, was uh, that uh, was kind of um, laid out in the market dialogue uh, and communicated to the developers. Uh, so the cost was uh, borne uh, by the developers. So the developers uh, already knew in advance how much uh, they would pay uh, for the power evacuation infrastructure. But Energinet basically was mandated by the initial agency to design and build the uh, uh, offshore infrastructure. Of course, over time, uh, as the market develops, uh, as the prices go down, um, uh, of course, uh, the responsibility is more given to the developer. Uh, for example, in the Tor uh, project, offshore substation uh, design uh, and building is given to the, to the developer, the ownership of that. Uh, area is given to the developer, uh, and the idea behind was that the developer, with developers, experienced developers, with their uh, portfolio uh, and with their uh, know-how, actually can find uh, a much better solution, a much cheaper solution uh, for uh, offshore substation. Um, and the new tenders uh, will be also uh, uh, more uh, the uh, the. Uh, export cable will be uh, also given to the uh, responsibility of the developer. And future plans, maybe the onshore part will be uh, more uh, given to the uh, the developer. So uh, it's more, uh, it's, it's less and less regulated uh, and more given to the market over time as the market matures. But these steps need to be taken really at good time, not uh, uh, without any... Uh, uh, like with the maturation steps over time because price is very important. The idea is to always keep the price, but at the same time develop a market that uh, is efficient. Uh, so that is how I can I can try to explain uh, without into electrical details, but I can say the responsibility is on mostly energy. Thank you. So I think we also have two related questions on this. The first one is that uh, is there any spillage of uh, offshore wind generation on account of high grid frequency? Uh, and also, if there has been any study done for grid balancing of offshore wind generation in India? So any of the speakers, if they would like to respond to this? Alp, maybe you'd like to take the... Um, I mean, it is... So, um, I personally am not uh, the one uh, working on the grid balancing, but the Danish Energy Agency team is also working with uh, other uh, uh, public authorities, government agencies uh, in India. Uh, for example, uh, we have also an expert, uh, a second to uh, Grid India, um, so old name for circle. So they have been working on this, not specifically on offshore wind, but on uh, uh, balancing uh, issues of offshore on, onshore wind and solar on specific um, state. Um, so from our side, I can say uh, no, not yet, but we are going hand in hand on these programs. So uh, I'm working on the offshore program, but of course with the offshore, uh, like uh, the intermittent power uh, introduced into the, into the grid, uh, we will also uh, tackle uh, these problems of how they are handled. But um, I can say the good thing about offshore wind is that um, it is uh, it uh, it has a more smoother profile 
compared to um, solar and wind. So, uh, of course, this is an area that needs to be covered. But at the same time, um, uh, as Mr. Bora mentioned um, uh, in his presentation, it brings less issues uh, compared to other uh, renewable energy resources. I'll, I'll just add here sure. uh, that uh, if, uh, 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 if we look at the Indian grid system, so the India is uniquely placed to have a one grid for the entire country. And uh, our grid is already having a, a total renewable of about 185 gigawatt. And out of which the variable renewable, which is going into the grid is about 130 gigawatt. And by 2030, we already come out with a plan where we are going to have the expansion of everything. And by 2030, we are going to have about 500 gigawatt of the uh, renewable out of which more than 400 gigawatt will be the variable RE. So in that, the addition of about 30 gigawatt of offshore wind will not have much of the challenge because offshore wind is much more smoother and much more uh, easily integrated into the system. However, having said that the Grid India CA has been doing all such uh, studies and they are taking care that how they should increase their reserve so that they can do the integration. Apart from that, we already have the renewable energy management center in most of the RE rich states. And further where the RE uh, is reaching about 30% of the total installed capacity, the additional REMCs are being set up in those states. So these REMCs along with the load dispense centers, which are five in the country, are trying to see that how they can manage the grid. And uh, the RE doesn't have much of the effect on the grid. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bora. Um, I think we also have multiple questions on the costing aspect as expected. Uh, what I'm going to do is try to club these questions, put them forward. And due to paucity of time, I'll ask each of the speakers to react and maybe also add their concluding uh, remarks as they uh, you know, comment on the question. So one of the question is that uh, it's great to see reducing trend of LCOE of OSUW projects globally. But is it based on CCFD component, that is carbon contracts for difference? And if so, then actual LCOE is more than what is being uh, projected. Another question is that what may be the CUF of the offshore wind at the coast of Gujarat and Tamil Nadu? Uh, again, more specific questions on the LCOE of India. Uh, and also we have one question which states that while generally the cost, the capital cost of offshore will be higher than inland site, whether there's any assessment that has been done to say how much, what would be the extent of this cost differential uh, and also the additional environmental impact due to it being offshore. So I will restrict myself here. There are other multiple related questions, uh, but uh, I think we'll just go by the order of speakers. So I request you to react to the question and also uh, add a line of uh, concluding remark, if I may, uh, Mr. Bora. Yeah. So when it comes to the CUF in the coast of uh, Gujarat, uh, it, as per our study, it is coming somewhere around uh, uh, 40 CUF. 40 CUF is coming. And when it comes to the coast of uh, Tamil Nadu, as of now, because Tamil Nadu, the field study has not been done. So whatever study has been done based on the satellite data, it gives the CUF of 47%. And uh, we are expecting that with the ground data coming up, it will be touching somewhere around 49 to 50. That will be the CUF. Uh, when it comes to the uh, LCOE, so like we have done our own calculations based on these CUFs and profiles. And we have found that... Uh, the cost somewhere in Gujarat, uh, based on the data which were available about uh, one and a half year back, was coming to about uh, seven rupees. And when it comes to in the Tamil Nadu, 
then it was coming to about 5.2 uh, rupees per unit. Uh, however, if we add the uh, cost of the uh, multipliers, RE multiplier, so which already the Ministry of Power has uh, more or less approved and uh, it will be notified soon by the CRC as I have seen one of the uh, question was about the carbon multiplier as well. So if that is being done, then the cost will further go down. And I think ALP can add more to this because he is the one who has been associated with all these calculations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bora. Uh, Mr. Karul? Uh, Mr. ALP would like to go first. Uh, I can try. I think, uh, yeah, uh, this, uh, as Mr. Bora mentioned, these studies uh, are, these numbers are coming from uh, uh, one and a half years ago. So with the supply chain developments, uh, although uh, we are seeing that the costs are coming down in uh, mature markets, uh, we can easily see uh, uh, the increases or, as uh, Mr. Peterson mentioned, uh, some non profit some of the tenders uh, in UK, US, uh, and some companies actually cancelling uh, their projects. So uh, supply chain effects uh, have been uh, really, uh, uh, and supply chain effects had really uh, impact uh, on the project development recently. Uh, and we should expect a similar impact uh, on the numbers that we calculated one and a half year ago. Uh, other than that, the, the general uh, trend of uh, cost going down, at least uh, I can tell, I can tell from Denmark, uh, is actually uh, less the to the carbon market. It's it's all the de-risking elements uh, that has been uh, taken into consideration that has developed the Danish market. So um, uh, in that sense, uh, that is um, what also we would like to. Uh, achieve in India uh, with uh, using all the tools and of course uh, uh, in Europe uh, also market uh, using the exchange market uh, or markets uh, was had a big impact on the final cost especially on de-risking the final cost of offshore. Um, so those, those are the things I can say uh, hopefully we will see the same developments in India uh, because I think uh, personally, uh, but a lot of my colleagues also think it is better to have um, uh, as precise uh, cost of electricity, uh, the real time cost of electricity as much as possible is uh, beneficial in terms of planning, in terms of investments, uh, and in terms of uh, yeah, de-risking uh, uh, more effectively rather than going on uh, very long contracts. We which is uh, necessary in complementing the market. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, Mr. Karul. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I had a different perspective on the SUE and the cost estimates. Uh, basically. Uh, most of the time, this is seen as a the cost of the SUE as on day. But one need to remember that uh, what are the cost estimates are there? That is for the future. Uh, when the project is going to get commissioned, maybe after six, seven years, 10 years from now. So uh, the LCO need to be taken in, in that sense. And the numbers are based on the uh, today's estimates. Probably the realization of those numbers of LCO would be at a later uh, date of maybe a couple of years down the line. Uh, having said that, uh, there was a question on a CFD also. In the mature market uh, like UK or maybe some other European markets, uh, the subsidies are more or less now going to zero or there have been incidences where negative subsidies are also quoted. So the markets, as the market is matured, the scales get uh, right. Probably there won't be any subsidy requirement or support requirement from the, the government side. Since India is, is a maturing or is a just a beginning on this particular aspect, couple of projects, a couple of capacities at a few gigawatts of capacities initially will very much require subsidy support or maybe 
there is some indirect support in terms of RECs and some other uh, incentives, uh, maybe in terms of uh, custom benefits and other things, which will drive down the, the, the NCOE in the Indian market. So we need to customize our, our cost model, our uh, NCOE modeling in the Indian context, and then see how these numbers get reflected in the uh, in, in the Indian context as such. But uh, given uh, globally, the numbers are in the range of six, seven uh, cents per, uh, per uh, unit or per kilowatt hour, uh, the Indian uh, NCOE probably would be slightly higher compared to that. But that would be for the initial projects. But over the period, we can also expect the, the similar numbers as uh, the market values probably will be close to or less than at least uh, 10 cents uh, uh, per kilowatt hour. Thank you. Thank and you so thanks much. For, thanks for Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Thor Peterson, any concluding remarks, reactions? Well, I, um, I've i also followed the, the LCOE deduction over the past uh, 15 years and also taking part in in uh, developments and design and research to to reduce the levelized cost of energy. And I'm, I'm of course, very much in favor of that. Uh, of course, it, it shouldn't go to a, a race to the bottom to, to simply increase the turbine size uh, in expense of, uh, I mean, generating a supply chain, which is pressed on the finances because it needs to be a a win-win situation for the companies involved to make a success for uh, the offshore wind uh, installation uh, in the future. Um, I, I guess most of the, the offshore wind farms in Europe are serious subsidy uh, bits uh, at the moment. They are fully commercial. Of course, uh, considerations to move some of the packages, maybe the export cable package to the TSO when the project finance is, uh, is, uh, is pressed has been, been done previously. But um, I think just uh, on, in my view, at least in mature markets, the LCOE doesn't need to go further down at the moment. Uh, we, we are where we need to be. So thank you for the invitation to join. Thank you so much. Uh, and I wish we could have continued the discussion looking at the Q&A box. There's uh, a lot more, uh, which basically shows, uh, you know, uh, what an important topic offshore wind is for India as well as for EU. And I hope uh, even though this is our concluding session for this cycle, but the discussions and the cooperation carries through. Uh, before we bid goodbye, uh, I would like for us to maybe take a picture. Amrita, can we... Can we have a virtual image for us? So I would request everyone to just look into the camera for a minute. Yeah. Okay. Done. done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Johanna. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the participants uh, for taking time out. And um, we had a wonderful time, and I hope you did too. Um, hopefully, see you in the seventh cycle. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.